<laughs> well, actually, I wanted to talk about this circle. So imagine that this circle is an area of uh, human endeavor that you're really interested in, but you know nothing about, right? And, but you want to get engaged with it, but it's always going to have a bunch of experts in it. And if you try and say something, these experts are going to say something like this. Hey, kid, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. But I want to talk to you today about the fact that I don't think a little knowledge of something is a dangerous thing. I actually think it's a really, really great thing. Uh, I am and always have been a geek. This is me at five years old. Uh, I grew up in uh, Adelaide, Australia. I just remembered I'm going to stand in a circle. I grew up in Adelaide, Australia, um, and I always loved tinkering. Here I am helping my dad fix the family car, uh, but I was always building things, breaking things. I was a, a horror of a kid. Uh, but I ended up doing engineering um, and then did a PhD in electrical engineering. Uh, and then, you know, I, I loved doing it. I loved building things. And the problem was at the time in Australia, which was the 1980s, um, if you got a degree in electrical engineering, my speciality was building sp silicon chips, there was no jobs for you in Australia. Uh, so eventually um, I decided to leave Australia and move to the US because that's where silicon chips uh, were and still are built. Um, and in fact, uh, to make it even more difficult, I moved from beautiful sunny Australia in the middle of summer uh, to uh, darker central New Jersey in the middle of winter. Um, and I worked in this uh, giant glass box. It's actually an amazing institution called Bell Labs, which was a research organization, had 17 Nobel Prize winners. Bell Labs invented the transistor, the laser, the communication satellite, the Unix operating system, all sorts of stuff. Um, had a great time there, um, but I've always been someone that tends to get a little bored, and I realized I didn't want to spend the rest of my career working on those things. And uh, went to Columbia, uh, got an MBA at Columbia, came out of that, and uh, those of you in the audience that have an MBA, you may know, we able to attest, you come out with an MBA convinced you can do anything, because they say, you're really smart, you're really smart. And so I thought I could do startup companies, and so I did a series of startup companies, and they started off awful and gradually got less worse over time. Um, <laughs> Eventually, I ran one, uh, founded one with some uh, friends at Caltech uh, called Helixis that built a small, D a kind of a DNA sequencer. Uh, we sold it to a company called Illumina, which is a big DNA sequencing company uh, down in San Diego. I arrived there, and I was a company that was full of really smart scientists and biologists, and I literally didn't do any biology in my entire school career. I thought it was cutting up frogs, I didn't want anything to do with it, and so I never touched it. So I arrived in this company, I was trying to work out what it, it was that I might be able to do, um, and I got really curious about the idea of these DNA sequences were all over the world and they were generating all this data, but no, there was nowhere to pull all the information together where you could start to make interesting observations about it. So um, I led a team and we built a thing called BaseSpace, which let all of Illumina's sequences uh, upload data on the internet into the cloud computing infrastructure that Amazon has built. It's actually the one that broke down the other day. But it was an amazing system, and it's now the world's biggest um, genome database. Uh, again, I got a little bored, a little frustrated, because uh, that was kind of working well, and I got antsy. <laughs> and uh, got given a very different job, uh, which was being an evangelist for Illumina's technology and uh, the use of DNA sequencing in medicine. Uh, so that was an extraordinary opportunity. I traveled all over the world, uh, met lots of interesting people, with the idea of getting together with governments and saying, how sequencing and what's called precision medicine could help their healthcare systems. Uh, great pleasure for me is I got to have dinner with the Prime Minister of Australia, with he and his wife at his house, which was an absolutely amazing opportunity as a kid that grew up in Australia. And then just a couple of weeks ago, I left Illumina, because I got bored again, and uh, have just started um, what's now my fifth, I think, fourth or fifth company, a company called Chromacode, um, also down uh, San Diego way. But along this path, what I found is that in the various jobs I've done, some don't require a lot of creativity. Uh, some of them do rely, rely on a lot of creativity. Um, but what I concluded over time is that the, the things that's interesting around creativity is when you jumble two things together that haven't previously been um, uh, done. You know, I think uh, someone like Einstein, right, really bright people don't have to do this because they'll be creative and invent something like, bam, it just comes out of nowhere. Um, but for the rest of us, I think the best we can do is find something here and find something here and bring it together and see what it means, you know, jumble it around. The problem with that is you're usually coming from somewhere where you, maybe you know a reasonable amount, but you've got to come into this other area and you probably don't know anything around it. And this is where you get this, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. But as I think you probably appreciate, it's also advantageous if you push past the experts, the experts that are skeptical, if you push past them, 
um, you can actually be coming at things in a very new way. And obviously there's a lot of students here, and, and I would urge you to, to understand, you are so well equipped to do that. You have so few preconceptions about things um, that I would say your ignorance is perhaps your biggest uh, competitive advantage. Uh, a couple of examples that are current at the moment, um, Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, you know, took uh, the traditional Broadway musical and combined it with hip-hop and American history um, and built Hamilton, right? Just an absolutely amazing success. Um, Trey Parker and Matt Stone um, took animation and profanity, right? Animation, which is like the most conservative and motherhood and apple pie uh, medium in, in American television, and put profanity in it. Um, and came up with South Park, right? And you can tell, if you watch South Park for 10 seconds, they were no animators, right? They are not animation <laughs> experts. Uh, but they were absolutely profanity experts. <laughs> and then, um, of course, um, you know, in recent times, probably most memorably, uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, he was not a technologist. He wasn't an engineer. He wasn't an expert designer. Uh, but he was uh, good enough at several of those things um, to be absolutely amazing in terms of the results that he got. Um, I was very fortunate in the, um, the early 1990s at Bell Labs, um, he came to visit us. And at the time, uh, this was sort of pre uh, what I would call uh, consumer internet, the internet existed, and Bell Labs had a big role in how the internet was designed and how it worked. And uh, Steve came to visit us um, to tell us what a bunch of idiots we were. <laughs> And um, this was surprising, right? Because I was sitting next to Arno Penzias, who's a Nobel Prize winner, and Steve is up there, and he, um, and we're very, you know, immersed in the technology and how it works and this and that, TCP, IP, and packets and switches and all this sort of thing. And he had such a, he wasn't a detailed, knowledgeable person on that issue, but he had this really clear vision, right? He had the Steve Jobs vision. He was looking at networking, right? He looked at a million things. We've seen it all, right? We looked at music, he looked at phones. But right then he was looking at networking. He said, um, I wish I had a wall. He said, uh, you know, all I want is um, to be able to plug the computer into the wall. Just like I plug it in and get electricity out of it, I want to plug a cable into the wall and get data across the country or across the world. It needs to be that simple to use. And I can't believe you people are so effing stupid that you can't do that. <laughs> and we were all blown away. It was amazing. He was so compelling and so extraordinary that it really changed the course of all the work we were doing around networking and how we thought about the internet. And I've often marveled, in fact, that if he made that big a difference to that group of people in just one day of his life, in all the days of his life, he must have done, as we know, um, pretty extraordinary things. So nothing on that scale, but just to give you my little story of creativity, as I mentioned, I got a PhD in electrical engineering and I knew how to design chips. I wasn't actually very good at it because I'm not a detail person and if you're designing something with a billion pieces in it, you actually have to be a detail person, but it would get by all right. But also when I was a kid, I was fascinated by cameras. My mother was a professional photographer and she had a dark room. Um, and for those old enough to remember, once upon a time, uh, cameras had film in them, which is a chemical process. The light went onto the film, you developed the film in another chemical, and you printed it, and you developed the paper in another chemical, and then you fixed it. It was actually kind of fun as a kid, because it seemed kind of magical and, and, and kind of chemically. Uh, but when I got to Bell Labs, and I knew about chips, um, I was really interested in the idea of, could you build a chip that would uh, detect the light from the image? You know, could you build the equivalent of film out of a chip? Um, and I wasn't the only person that was working on this. I, I, looked around and found a group at um, NASA who were very interested in building very tiny light cameras for spacecraft. And we teamed up together um, and worked for a number of years and actually ended up um, building um, what are called active pixel sensors, which are the kind of chips that you would find um, today uh, inside every cell phone. I think there's around 2 billion of them built every year. Um, but along the way, we hit some rough patches. I remember once going to um, uh, one of the big Japanese uh, camera manufacturers and visiting him in Japan and showing them the images that we have, and they literally just laughed at us. You know, the kind of polite Japanese laughter, we couldn't really tell what was going on. Um, <laughs> but they were laughing at us because they thought that we thought that somehow these crude pictures would one day in any way um, overtake film, uh, film cameras. Uh, and then uh, something I did a little after that, again, the concept of bringing two things together. Um, someone asked me, given these cameras, was there a way we could um, detect fingerprints. And I was thinking, well, you could have, because right back then you would use a camera to look at a fingerprint. Um, but then I started to think what it would be like. I would look, because I didn't know anything about fingerprints, but you can just look at your own fingerprint. You can see obviously that there are ridges and valleys, right? There's, there's depth and height. 
And I started to think, well, if you were a silicon chip and there was a finger on top of you, what would it look like? And there'd be big ridges and there'd be big gaps. Um, and we built a chip and it actually uh, worked the first time um, based on fingerprints. Um, and we actually built um, the first fingerprint chip and filed the patents back in 1995. And around one billion of those uh, are made every year. I never made a cent out of it, but Apple does own my patent. That's my uh, claim to fame uh, around that. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, but in this process, you know, it, it also uh, let me think about uh, along the way different stages because I went back to get my MBA and I got my PhD. So I've done a lot of school and think about learning and the importance of learning. Um, and back to, you know, the prior talk about pivoting, I was in research, I got my MBA, that let me come out as a business person, right? Uh, learning and, and doing a course can help you a lot in the pivot. And again, I would urge folks, uh, obviously the students here, uh, to stress the importance of that. Education can come back at any point in your life um, and be a big help in making a pivot. So learning's important. But the more, um, for me personally, and maybe this is just in my nature, the most effective thing for me uh, is failure. Uh, this is SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk's company, who've been working to land uh, rockets, right, to recover the rocket. First time I'm going to land it, but nearly every time they do it, it just falls over and crashes into the ground. And they have no shame about this. They're like, eh, it's probably not going to work. And put the rocket up, it's going to come down, it's going to fall over. Um, and you know, the funny thing, they land them on these barges, and uh, they call that barge, um, uh, tell me again you love me, which I think is a great name for a barge. Um, but, you know, the ability to try things and fail is incredibly powerful. Um, someone once said to me, you don't, it's actually someone who gave me some venture capital money when I didn't think they would because I just screwed something up. He said, oh, people don't learn anything from success. You only learn from failure. I'm sure you learned a lot. It was other people's money. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> and so I think failure is an amazing tool. So when you think about learning, and this may not be popular with all the parents here, um, I don't think it's that important what you learn, right? I think it's important that you pick something you want to learn that you're going to enjoy, that you're going to get good at, that you get a skill, whether it be uh, writing, whether it be painting, whether it be coding, get that skill because that's your first step out into the world. That gets you the credibility to get to your first job. It lets you actually contribute to teams as soon as you're there. So I don't think you should worry too much about it. Uh, again, Steve Jobs is probably more the exception than the rule we should follow, but the only formal tertiary schooling I think he did was calligraphy, right? He was at Reed College and he audited some calligraphy classes and he said for years afterwards that that had a huge impact on his thoughts around aesthetics. So you never know, I don't think it's, it's possible to say what the right subject particularly is. And by the same token, um, when you're choosing the thing you're going to fail at, you've got to really be passionate about that because it's going to be painful, it's not going to work, and you don't want to fail at something and then go away and do something else. That's a little counterintuitive. You actually want to come back and do the same thing that you just failed at because you will have learnt a lot on the prior turn. So it's not a good policy, I don't think, to fail and go, well, that, I'm no good at that, I should move on to the next thing. I think, uh, again, speaking from personal experience, fail and fail and fail and keep failing at the same thing. It's very important. <laughs> the thing that I love to do is um, start companies. Um, and the reason is, and I used to love engineering, as I said, but what I found even more interesting that we can do in this, this country, in this day and age in particular, with venture capital, is uh, people start with just an idea, right? A completely ephemeral thing. An idea, can't touch it, feel it, it isn't worth anything, it's just a thought. And then you take that idea and you spin a story around it. You spin a story about how it's going to change the world, um, why it's going to make money. Go out to venture capitalists, and if you do a good job, they'll give you money, which is just amazing to me. Because you, you, you had nothing a moment ago, and now you have a bunch of money to turn the nothing into something. <laughs> then you turn the something, and you build a business. Now, it often doesn't work. But I just love that idea of the, <laughs> the nothing to something. Um, and so I'll give you my first example of something not working. So back in the day when we were doing the um, fingerprint companies, I got the MBA, and I thought, oh, I'll do a fingerprint company. Um, it was a terrible disaster. Um, tens of millions of dollars wasted. I was the CEO. Um, it lasted about three torturous years where I never slept, uh, as Cherry will attest. And the weird thing about it, it actually wouldn't have done any good if I'd done a good job, because the reality was the fingerprint sensors were invented in um, 1995. It wasn't until 15 years later 
that they started to appear in cell phones. It was, as things often are, it just wasn't ready. It was too expensive, it was too fragile, it was going to take a lot of work and a lot of evolution. So a lot of the time these things are um, timing as well. So fingerprint sensors happened, but as I said, um, 15 years after we thought they would. Second time around, it was a company called um, Luxterra, which was a technology out of Caltech, and it brought um, optical fibers directly into silicon chips, so silicon chips could talk to each other directly using light instead of electrons, which they typically do. Um, that one still took 10 years, and it's still, it's, it's actually thriving now, but it went through a lot of pain, um, and it took until the big cloud computing companies were building these giant data centers where they needed light to move from one side of the, uh, to the other instead of electrons, um, that Luxterra really found its feet. And then, you know, uh, getting a little worse, least worse each time, um, Helixis was less than three years from when we took the idea, we raised the venture capital money, uh, and we sold it to Illumina. Uh, so again, but think about that, I don't mean to put, again, the, particularly the, the young folks here off, it took 15 years of trying and um, uh, mucking it up to get that right. So I want to leave you with this. Be excited. We live in an extraordinary time in an extraordinary place, and you are the recipients of a most extraordinary education. Uh, you're going to learn, you have been learning, and you will continue to learn as you go to college. Uh, you'll get the opportunity to create. Um, I think the period of time in your 20s and your 30s is an extraordinary. I don't know what's going on in the human brain. I think it's partly this, don't know what you don't know. Um, it can be an amazing uh, creative time. Uh, then, you'll, if, you, if you do well at that, they'll give you more resources and you can screw up and learn a few times. And that's a uh, you know, pretty exciting part uh, of, of growing up, and eventually you will succeed. Thank you very much. <laughs>